<laughs> oh, look at that. Another piece came off. <laughs> you never notice, right? Oh, no, that's not true. It's a little warm. It's comfortable to me. Does it? It's good. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's going to get a lot, a lot hotter when you uh, yeah. get it off. You're probably going to drop it. Too, so. We're live now. It's not a tweet. If you can beat me to it, you can try to send out a tweet. I'm looking for trying to copy the link. Oh, I know. I know. Hello, if you're viewing, we will be with you shortly. We're going to start uh, right around noon, so I'm about two minutes. Yeah, tweet the link again. And if I can get it out for you on know, Facebook also. We live in about one minute. Usually a few. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you got on Facebook too? All right, we will get started in about a minute. What's the hashtag we got right now? Preparathon sixteen. started. Charlie, thank you all for joining us here today. Should we mute this? Or close it on, uh, on the speaker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's turn the speakers down. Do we need it? I don't think we do. Yeah. Is everyone hearing us fine out there? And we'll get started uh, whenever you're ready. All right. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate you uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Woodall. Welcome to the National Weather Service Forecast Office here in Memphis. And uh, kind of a neat uh, program that we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, this is for the Shelby County Preparathon, a uh, large a week long preparedness event. Uh, it's actually part of the National Preparathon, which was organized by FEMA, but uh, our partners with the Shelby County Office of Preparedness have really uh, stepped up and uh, uh, taken an aggressive stance in getting, uh, helping get the county ready. And uh, before we get into our severe weather awareness presentation for this afternoon, I'd like to bring up Mr. Lavelle Blanchard from the Shelby County Office of Preparedness to talk a little bit more about the, the Preparathon here in Shelby County. Thank you, Gary. Uh, appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> we kicked this uh, event off on last Thursday 
with uh, a press conference where all the municipal mayors were present and they signed a proclamation declaring this uh, Shelby County's uh, preparathon. And the week started, actually starts today with uh, Weather Awareness Day. And what we want you all to do as citizens is to go out and uh, download uh, one of the apps that's available to you. You can uh, uh, read a Tennessee, the Red Cross, the National Weather Service app, uh, and you can also, even though we don't have an app at this time, you can get information from our website, staysafeshelby.us. Tomorrow, we're, we're going to highlight uh, flood dangers. As you all know, flooding can happen anywhere, anytime. And uh, this, you can uh, think back to last week, week before last, when they had the flooding in uh, Houston. Uh, and we've had that same type of flash flooding, severe flooding here in Shelby County. So we just want you to, to be aware of that. And uh, uh, some of you probably know that uh, your insurance will not c cover you. So you go to our website or go to FEMA's website and download uh, and uh, look at uh, their firm, uh, FEMA Insurance uh program uh national flood management program so you can see whether or not you are actually in a flood zone or not uh wednesday we're going to do a tornado drill weather permitting um and we're also highlighting um at that time uh the no weather radio and getting your personal kit together for that day and Thursday is uh, Earthquake Awareness Day, and you all know that we sit on the new size, the, the new magic seismic zone, and that uh, they say that we're going to have an earthquake here in Shelby County sooner or later, sometime in the next 50 years. So we are going to highlight that and want everyone to be prepared for that. And Friday is Personal and Business Preparedness Day. That means you look at what you need to do to get yourself prepared and for the businesses who are listening in, uh, what you can do to help your employees and, and for your uh, business so that you can remain resilient and, and, and recover from whatever happens, whether it's the tornado, flooding, or the earthquake. Um, and then we're on Saturday, even though it's uh, supposed to end on Friday, we, we're going to take it another day on Saturday, we're doing uh, Disaster Trails, uh, which is uh, we're going to simulate uh, having an earthquake here in Shelby County and delivering supplies via bicycles. Uh, so uh, we ask you to join us to take uh, part in that. Gary, anything else? Uh, that uh, appreciate you all coming down, Lavelle, and appreciate the uh, the partnership that we at the Weather Service have uh, with the uh, Shelby County Office of Preparedness. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here today. Now, the program we're going to run through here, it's our Severe Weather Awareness and Planning Program. Leads a lot into a lot of the concepts that Lavelle highlighted that will be coming up for the next week. Um, we'll run for about 25, 30 minutes or so with this presentation, then have about 15 minutes or so at the end for any questions that you might have regarding uh, severe weather preparedness. Uh, you can tweet those questions to us on our website at NWS Memphis. Uh, you can also use the hashtag preparathon16. And uh, again, that'll get the questions to us, and then we will uh, answer them as we go through the last 15 minutes or so of our, our hour that we have for the program today. So with that, we will go ahead and get our screen set up and uh, start off with the presentation. And again, this is our severe weather awareness uh, practices and procedures presentation. If we can get that uh, screen shared, we will uh, get off and on and on, uh, on our way. Bear with us just a moment here. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so to begin with, uh, we need to um, look at some basic, and I'm actually not uh, advancing here. Um, Let me try it here. Yeah. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, not advancing. 
Oh, there we go. Okay. Really? Oh, okay. Um, beginning with some fundamental definitions, just to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as the terminology that we're using. First and most important is the difference between a watch and a warning. Now, all watches are issued by the Storm Prediction Center in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, tornado and severe thunderstorm watches. The watches indicate that conditions are becoming favorable for hazardous weather. The ingredients are coming together to produce tornadoes and or severe thunderstorms. Watches are valid for about six hours on the average and tend to cover a large area. Most of uh, West Tennessee and Mississippi, as you see the red outline counties here. So if we come under a watch, you can continue your normal activities, but pay closer attention to the weather developments over the next several hours because the watch indicates again that we're expecting things to go downhill in the next several hours. A warning, on the other hand, is an urgent message issued by our office here in Memphis. It indicates that storm spotters have observed a tornado or a severe thunderstorm, or we've detected a possible tornado or severe thunderstorm on radar. Warnings are valid for usually one hour or less and are usually issued for the, the portions of the counties, the areas that are actually going to be near the forecast path of that storm. So if we come under a warning, listen closely to the text of that warning. We're going to tell you where the storm is, what direction it's moving, what we're expecting from the storm, and what cities and communities are going to be near the path of that storm. And if you're going to be near the path, that's when you're going to want to implement your plan, take the actions that we're going to talk about today. A tornado is defined as a violently rotating column of air attached to the base of a thunderstorm and in contact with the ground. A severe thunderstorm is a storm which produces either hail one inch in diameter, about the size of a quarter or larger, and or wind gusts 58 miles an hour or stronger. Now you notice this definition says nothing about lots of lightning and thunder, about really heavy rainfall, about dark, scary looking clouds coming in. Only the wind, the hail, or technically a tornado would, would make a storm severe. A flash flood is defined as a rapid rise of water, usually during or after a period of heavy rain. Now we say usually because other things can cause a flash flood like a dam break or a levee failure, a debris jam up underneath the bridge. But usually when we're talking about flash floods, we're talking about too much rain in too short a period of time. So when it comes to being ready, the first, uh, several steps that we need to take to make sure that we're ready for severe weather. The first step is to have a plan, to know and understand the threats that severe weather can bring, severe storms can bring, and to know what you're gonna do for each of those situations. Designate your safe areas in advance. The time to figure out where you're gonna go if a tornado threatens is not when the tornado warning has been issued and the storm is knocking at your door. You need to designate those safe areas in advance. Practice your plan regularly. Make sure that everybody's familiar with their roles and what they're supposed to do. Again, the first time you enact your plan should not be during the stress and chaos of an actual severe weather event moving through. Be able to receive weather information. I've had the task of being on a number of disaster surveys following events in which uh, there were casualties from severe weather. And a lot of times the breakdown in the process was in people just not knowing that the severe storms were coming. So have as many ways as possible to get the severe weather information. And then enact your plan quickly if severe weather threatens. Our average lead time for a tornado warning is about 13 minutes right now, but sometimes they can develop much faster than that or move into your area very quickly, very, uh, uh, very suddenly. So enact your plan quickly if severe weather threatens. And then have contingency and continuity plans, both on a, a personal level and on a business or a corporate level. And we'll touch some now on these main steps uh, as far as being ready for severe weather. Now, with the storms that we get here in the Mid-South in Shelby County, we have five main threats that we have to worry about. Tornadoes, flash floods, the straight line winds or the thunderstorm winds, large hail, and lightning. 
Now, of those five threats, uh, tornadoes are usually the one that grabs most of the headlines. And we'll unfortunately probably see a lot of headlines from the Great Plains uh, tomorrow. Uh, looks like maybe a significant tornado event uh, there in the Great Plains on Tuesday. But as far as these five threats are concerned, the one which kills the most people is flash flooding. Again, nearly 130 deaths annually across the country due to flash floods. It's the number one killer among thunderstorm related events. Most of those deaths occur in vehicles, people trying to drive through the floodwaters or people trying to walk through the floodwaters. A lot of the deaths also occur at night when the, the floodwaters are harder to see, the depth of the water is harder to determine. We can't really see the condition of the road underneath those floodwaters. So at night, it's a particularly dangerous situation. So when it comes to flash flood safety, turn around, don't drown is our flood safety slogan. It's pretty good rule to live by. If you're not near the flood, you're not going to get drowned in the flood. So just stay clear of those flooded areas. Uh, especially if you have young children, keep them away from the creeks and the ditches. It's fascinating to watch the water rush down through those creeks and ditches, but those banks can get slippery, muddy, easy for someone to fall in and get swept away. If you're doing any camping or hiking activities, scout out the area around your campsite. Find out where the high, gr the high ground is and how you can get to it quickly. And again, be very careful at night. Uh, very, very dangerous, as we talked about just a moment ago. Now, lightning is the number two killer among thunderstorm threats. Uh, when lightning strikes, it brings a temperature of about 50,000 degrees. That's hotter than the surface of the sun and an electrical current of about 30,000 amps. And medical experts say it takes less than one amp to theoretically stop your heart. So lightning can be potentially deadly as far as the temperature and the electricity is concerned. Now, when lightning strikes, it wants to find the shortest, easiest path it can from the cloud down to the ground. So lightning wants to strike the tallest objects in the area it can find. So if you're under a tree, a telephone pole, a power pole, out in the open, out on the boat, out on the lake, those are all going to be vulnerable targets to lightning. So when it comes to lightning safety, if a lightning storm approaches, Move inside a solid, sturdy, grounded building or an all-metal vehicle. Not a convertible, but a hardtop vehicle will also offer pretty good protection from lightning. Want to get off the lake, get off the golf course, get away from those vulnerable areas that we talked about. Again, stay away from the trees, the power poles, athletic stands, light poles, other things that are going to be good targets for lightning. Now, if you have time when you get inside, Turn off the non-essential electrical appliances and unplug them if you have time. If lightning strikes uh, your home or nearby, some of that current could come in and, and might damage any electronics like your TV or your stereo that are plugged in. If you can hear the thunder from a storm, you're getting in range of being struck by the lightning. So that's when you want to move inside, get to a safer location, and then stay in that shelter area until 30 minutes after you hear the last thunder. Give that storm plenty of time to get a safe distance away. Now, when it comes to severe thunderstorms, which bring large hail and damaging winds, the, the, the most important thing here is to not minimize the threat. Don't think to yourself, oh, the Weather Service only issued a severe thunderstorm warning on this storm, not a tornado warning, so it's not going to be that bad. Some of the most destructive sing single thunderstorm events in U.S. history did not have tornadoes, very large hail, very damaging winds, and so these can be disastrous events in and of themselves. If a severe thunderstorm approaches, move inside a solid, sturdy uh, building, reinforced building, and stay away from the windows because, again, the winds in these severe thunderstorms can exceed 100 miles an hour. They can cause the same damage that a small to medium-sized tornado might cause. A mobile home, a vehicle, something which is not anchored down to the ground is not going to be good shelter from the wind. It's very easy for the winds of a, a strong, severe thunderstorm to uh, roll over a mobile home or a vehicle and can cause a, a lot of damage uh, to, those, uh, to those items. Then we have tornadoes. Now, unfortunately, here in the Mid-South, we lead the nation as far as killer tornadoes are concerned, tornadoes with fatalities associated with them. 
Most of the tornadoes that we see, not only in the Mid-South, but across the country as a whole, fall into the lower end of the intensity scale. But even these uh, tornadoes can have winds stronger than hurricane force. The strongest tornadoes have winds over 200 miles an hour. These can be extremely destructive. The average tornado may last uh, for seven, eight minutes and may cover a couple of miles across the ground. But as we saw back last December 23rd in northern Mississippi, tornadoes can be on the ground for over an hour, may cover 50 miles even further than that uh, across the ground. Now, these violent tornadoes uh, are, are rare. Maybe only one out of 100 will fall into that category. But these are the tornadoes that cause most of the casualties and the injuries and the damage. We have a scale called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, or the EF Scale, uh, developed originally by Dr. Ted Fujita, a renowned uh, tornado researcher. And the Fujita Scale, or Enhanced Fujita Scale, rates the tornado intensity based on the damage that is caused. The scale goes from EF0 to EF5, where weak tornadoes, about oh, probably 83, 84% of what we'd see, would be EF0 and EF1. Strong tornadoes, EF2 and EF3, uh, maybe 16% or so of what we see. And then the violent tornadoes would be the EF4 and EF5. So if a tornado approaches and you're at home, at work, at school, in a building someplace, an underground shelter, an underground storm shelter is going to be the best place to be. If we don't have an underground shelter and if we don't have an above ground safe room, a reinforced safe room, then the next best option is a small interior room on the lowest floor of your building. Small closets, interior hallways, windowless interior bathrooms would be good options to use at that point. We really do encourage folks, though, to look into getting a safe room. If you, uh, if you don't have one, uh, there are some above ground reinforced rooms that can be installed. It's, uh, of course, much easier to do a new construction, but there are uh, companies and ways that safe rooms can be retrofitted into an existing home. The FEMA website, www.fema.gov, has some really good information on safe rooms and on windproofing uh, your home. And certainly recommend you check that out. Now, when you get into your safe area, you want to protect yourself from flying debris. Most of the deaths and injuries that occur, occur when people are struck by flying debris. So protect yourself with blankets, overcoats, a mattress. If you have a football helmet or a motorcycle helmet or a bike helmet, put that on to give your head a little extra protection. Now, mobile homes are an excellent, low-cost, quality way of life. A lot of the newer manufactured homes that are out there these days are really attractive, really nice to live in. There is nothing wrong with that. We need to remember, though, that the manufactured homes are just not a safe place to be in a tornado or a high wind event. So we need to have a better, a better place that we can go. Even if the mobile home is, is tied down, anchored down, want to get out of the mobile home and get into a more solid, sturdy, reinforced building, uh, a, a permanent structure nearby, the office or the laundry facility of a mobile home park, uh, those will all be better options. And those same rules apply if you uh, are in a school in a portable classroom, if you're out on a construction site, one of the construction trailers they often set up there, these same rules apply. You want to get to a more solid, sturdy building if a tornado approaches. Vehicles are another bad place to be in a tornado. Uh, we don't want to outrun the tornado in our vehicle or try to outrun the tornado. You might think you can do it, but remember, tornadoes don't have to stop for red lights. They don't have to follow the curves and twists in the road, and they can catch you much easier than you might think. So want to get out of the vehicle and get, in, get inside a sturdy reinforced building. Uh, a restaurant, a convenience store, uh, the back rooms of a, uh, a gas station away from the windows, uh, those are going to be better places to be. It's very easy for the winds of a tornado, especially a stronger tornado, to flip over a vehicle, pick it up, carry it off. In this case, this was a, a strong, almost violent tornado back about 10 years ago. And you can see that it basically bent this car sideways around a tree. So that's not a, not a place that we want to be. Now, as a last resort, if you're out in the open, there's no better shelter you can get to 
a ditch, a culvert, the lowest spot of ground you can find is the, the next last resort refuge to go to. I'll be up front though and tell you that that's not going to be as safe as being inside a solid building because you're still outdoors, you're still going to be vulnerable to all, all the debris that's flying around, and you're going to be vulnerable to flooding as well. A lot of the storms that produce our tornadoes also produce very heavy rainfall, and so flash flooding can be a threat. And please forget about the overpasses as far as tornado shelter. Uh, they, are, they are definitely not a place that we, that we want to be. The problem with overpasses is the winds and the debris can actually get funneled and accelerated up underneath the overpass, and it can be a very dangerous situation. In the best case, these overpasses offer only very limited shelter. Uh, if you look closely at that picture in the upper left, uh, you can see some light colored blotches underneath the overpasses there. Those are actually the outlines of people that were up underneath this overpass, literally got sandblasted by the dirt and the debris as the tornado moved across. Because really, if you think about it, we're putting ourselves here in an exposed, above ground location, just where we finish saying we should not be if a tornado approaches. We also can have traffic problems. If you get two or three or four people stopped underneath an overpass, uh, you, you're going to get an instant traffic jam, putting a lot of people at risk in a very vulnerable location with a potentially very dangerous event bearing down on them. Okay, so those are the threats that we face. Those are some of the safety tips we need to remember if severe weather threatens. Now we need to, now we need to practice our plan. Well, why? Well, it ensures that everybody is familiar with the roles that they're going to play in your severe weather plan. We'll talk about those here in just a few minutes. It makes sure that you have enough shelter areas designated for people to get to. This is especially true with schools and businesses and larger facilities that might need several different places in order to uh, uh, house their employees or their students or their, their visitors. Uh, we recommend drilling at least every three months or so just to keep everybody fresh and, and proficient. And we recommend drilling as soon as possible if you have any changes to your plans, uh, a change to your facility, for example, or if you have staff turnover amongst the key players that are going to be enacting your severe weather plan. Now, when it comes to staying uh, informed, getting the word uh, before and during a severe weather event, there are a couple of good places you can look to. First, the Storm Prediction Center, again, they're based in Norman, Oklahoma, issue national severe thunderstorm outlooks. They issue those for the current day, the next two days, and then a broader outlook for uh, the next week, basically. They'll indicate what parts of the country are going to be at risk from severe weather and what is the risk level of severe weather. And you can view these on their webpage, www.spc.noaa.gov. Also, they will usually post that information on their social media streams as well, their Twitter feed and their Facebook page. Now, our office, if we can back up, please. Once more. Now, our office in Memphis, we will issue a local hazardous weather outlook. We'll basically key off of the uh, SPC outlook, but we'll add a little bit more detail as far as timing, uh, specific threats, and, and uh, particular impacts that we're expecting on that particular day. And again, we post this a graphic on the top front of our main webpage, uh, weather.gov slash Memphis. And we also will put, the, put this information on our social media streams, especially if it's a, a more significant event that we're expecting. So what are some ways to get the actual warning information? Well, NOAA Weather Radio is a 24-hour broadcast of weather information that originates from our office. A lot of us have smartphones now, and there are some really good apps on the smartphones for displaying not only warnings, but radar information and the like. Those are all really good to use as well. Our partners in the commercial media, excellent at broadcasting the severe weather information. Of course, again, we post all of our watch and warning information on our web page and a lot of other partner agencies do as well. We post watch and warning information on our social media streams, not only us, but again, the Storm Prediction Center and the, the National, National Weather Service feed do as well. 
And then there are sirens, which are a part of the overall warning system and uh, you know, certainly need to be used and, and incorporated. But with all the other tools and methods that we have for getting severe weather information, someone saying, well, I didn't hear the sirens go off, so I didn't know the huge tornado was heading toward me. With all these other channels that we have, that's not really a good excuse anymore. So let's talk about a few of these now in a little bit more detail. Again, Weather Radio is a 24-hour broadcast of weather information. It originates from our office right here in Memphis. When we issue a watch or a warning on Weather Radio, we send out some special codes over the air. Those codes will activate alarms on the Weather Radio and uh, let you know that something's been issued for the area. Uh, so you don't have to have the radio on all the time. It's just uh, kind of like a smoke detector for severe weather. Those of you that do have weather radios know that we have that uh, neat sounding automated voice on there. Uh, yeah, we did lose some of the human quality when we went to this uh, automated voice several years ago, but what we gained is speed. It takes this system only a few seconds to get a warning on the air after we issue it. Of course, seconds can make all the difference in a tornado event. Now you can get weather radios at uh, some of the uh, uh, larger departments and home improvement stores, some of the big box stores. You can also get them online as well. We recommend if you have a, if you get a weather radio that it have battery backup, which most of them do these days. And we recommend that it have the same SAME technology, gives you some control over programming which radios and for which counties you want your radio to actually alarm. Again, a lot of good smartphone apps out there these days that show not only radar, but warning information. Uh, many of these will key into the uh, GPS function, the location function on your phone, and uh, warning polygons to uh, show if you're in the warning area or not. Now we recommend that uh, if, you, if you have one of these apps, we cannot recommend a specific app to get, uh, but we do suggest and, and encourage you to make sure that your app broadcasts our warnings and information. So you're getting everything straight from us here at the Weather Service. Our partners in the commercial media, again, really do an excellent job of broadcasting and disseminating that information out to their viewers and their listeners. We do a lot of really close coordination with our media partners before severe weather season. We'll do an area-wide workshop and a lot of them will come and attend and participate. And we'll also just do one-on-one -on -one type visits uh, just to make sure that we're as ready as we can be as we come into the severe weather season. We also, during severe weather events, have a secure online chat room between ourselves, our media, our emergency management and, and our storm spotter leaders. And we use that for collaboration uh, during storm events. They can ask us questions about particular storms that they're seeing. We can relay observations that we're seeing on radar or information that we're getting. Basically make sure that we're all, that we're all speaking with one voice. And that's really important that we give a consistent warning message to you so that you'll know when, uh, when we're talking that we're all saying the same thing and uh, that you really need to take the threat seriously and uh, take those actions that you need to. So there's our website. And again, www.weather.gov slash Memphis uh, will get you to our main web page. There at the top is the hazardous weather outlook graphic that I mentioned a few moments ago. And then down underneath there is the map, which uh, shows the uh, Mid-South area. If we have any watches or warnings in effect, uh, the counties will be color coded, uh, painted in on that bottom map. You can click on that for more information. Also get the latest forecast for right where you clicked your mouse, links to any of those watches and warnings, links to the radar and the satellite pictures as well. Now, again, we have social media and we've gotten active over the last uh, year, year and a half or so, uh, really uh, picked up, uh, stepped up our social media program. We do have a Facebook page and typically on Facebook, we'll post general information, uh, we'll post safety information, safety rules, safety tips, and briefing or outlook type of information as we're leading into a severe weather event. Uh, Twitter, again, at NWS Memphis is our Twitter address, and uh, you can uh, follow us and we'll give quick breaking information on Twitter of uh, storm updates, radar updates and the like. Uh, warnings will oftentimes be, uh, be posted on our Twitter feed as well. And then we also do have a YouTube page, and uh, we use the YouTube 
Uh, we'll post videos there. Mostly it'll be safety type information. If you go to our YouTube page this week, you'll see a number of uh, uh, safety announcements that we prepared in support of Shelby County's prepare a this week. Uh, we'll also include outlook type information and perhaps some storm summary information as well. Okay, now we got to put it all together as far as our plan is concerned and talk about roles and responsibilities. Who in your home, your school, your business, or your facility is responsible for monitoring weather information, especially if a watch gets issued for your area? Who's your weather watcher, if that's the case? Who is responsible for activating your severe weather plan and deciding, okay, the threat is materializing, we need to stop what we're doing and activate our plan? Who is responsible for fanning word out across the facility? This is really important for large uh, school campuses or multi-building facilities. How are you going to get the word out uh, all the way across your facility? How long does it take everybody to get to your shelter locations? And that's why the drilling and the practicing ahead of time is important so that you know how much time it takes, you know how much lead time you need to get everybody into safety before the storm reaches your location. Do you have backups in place, people backups, uh, uh, folks that would be able to step in and fill these key roles that we've talked about if uh, they're not available on that uh, particular day? Do you have technology backups in place for monitoring the weather information and for passing the word uh, through your facility? Then after the storm, we need to consider a couple of things as well. From the personal level, does your family know what to do? So that if you're separated and a, a, a tornado or a severe weather event comes through, that you'll, you'll know that they know what to do and how to respond. It will put your mind a little bit more at ease. Do you have a disaster supplies kit in your shelter location at home with uh, prescription medicines, for example, a spare pair of eyeglasses, uh, any special foods, uh, non-perishable foods that you might need, water, things that our friends at the Red Cross say to have to be ready for an emergency. Do you have a relative outside of the immediate area that family members can contact to check in? This really came up in New York City after the 9-11 uh, attacks occurred. People had a lot of difficulty making local phone calls in the area, but it was easier making long distance calls out of the area. So again, have someone outside the area that can be a check-in and a relay point to let everyone know everyone else is okay. And do you have your important papers and documents in a safe location, uh, like a, a safe deposit box at your bank? From the business level, uh, some things we need to consider as well. Can your business function from a remote location if your facility gets impacted, damaged by a tornado or a severe storm? What documents and what materials would you need in order to function from a remote location? Continuity of operations, or COOP, is the term that's used for, uh, for, for this concept. Do you have backups of your critical files and documents, uh, employee files, payroll records, and the likes in a safe location? And if you were trying to function from a remote location, what staff would you need there? Would you need any staff back at your original location for uh, overseeing any salvage and recovery type operations? Now, there are a lot of companies that um, will provide this business continuity type service now, and uh, you business owners probably are familiar with, uh, with those uh, ideas and those concepts and certainly recommend it. Okay, well, one big key of Preparathon is not just sharing the information, providing the information, but taking action and actually getting prepared, getting ready. So I have a homework assignment for you, and that is to develop a severe weather plan for your home. Uh, use the concepts and the ideas that we've discussed today. And if you already have a severe weather plan for your home, use these concepts and ideas to review and reinforce and enhance your plan uh, if possible. Share the plan with your family members, especially your, your kids, and let them be a part of the planning process. That can really help, really kind of empower them and make them feel like they're an important part of the planning process. So share that and have everything ready to go for Wednesday's tornado drills, that when the drill comes out, uh, you'll be able to practice your plan as this next step in the uh, Preparathon here in Shelby County. 
and tweet to us. Again, at NWS Memphis, tweet us when your plan is ready. So we can share that with Shelby County, uh, the Office of Preparedness, and uh, let them know that yes, we are, we are helping get people ready for uh, whatever's in store this severe weather season. So in summary, uh, again, the key, we will have severe weather threaten us again here in the Mid-South and Shelby County. We've been impacted by severe weather in the past. It's gonna happen again. So now is the time to develop your severe weather plan and to practice it. Make sure your family members and your coworkers know what to do when your weather threatens. Have as many ways as possible to get that severe weather information. One of those ways should be a NOAA weather radio, but have as many other ways, again, the smartphone apps, have as many ways as possible to get that severe weather information. When the threat materializes, act quickly. Again, you may only have a couple of minutes to make the decisions you need to, to activate your plan and get to safety. So use those precious seconds as wisely as you can. And then have your post-storm plans from the personal level, the family level, the home level, and from your business or your facility uh, perspective as well. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to contact us. Uh, again, our phone number, 5440399. Our webpage, weather.gov slash Memphis. Our Facebook is just facebook.com slash NWS Memphis. Like us on Facebook if you don't already. Twitter, again, at NWS Memphis is our Twitter handle. Follow us on Twitter if you haven't already. And then my email address, gary.woodall at noaa.gov. And we'll go ahead and switch out of the uh, screen sharing now and uh, come back to us. And uh, we'll see if we have any, any questions. Uh, John or Andy, do we have any questions that have been tweeted to us? So if you take this time, we'll give you a few minutes for it to catch up. So remember, tweet us your questions at NWS Memphis on Twitter or uh, Facebook and post them to our Facebook page. If uh, Andy will come up here, he'll And also, if you have any questions for uh, Lavelle, yeah. Mr. Blanchard, uh, from the Office of Preparedness perspective, he's still here with us. And uh, so you can tweet any uh, questions that you might have for uh, Mr. Blanchard as well. Mr. Blanchard, do you have any questions for us to start it off with? Yeah. No, sir. All right. Thank you. So we'll give you a few minutes to ask questions. And this presentation, if your family, if you watched it and you enjoyed it, you can share this presentation with your family members. The link will be live. It's been recorded. The YouTube YouTube records it. So you can share this link with your family members, share it to your Facebook and your Twitter pages, and uh, it'll be available throughout the week to review. Stone Yeah, one of the, one of the common questions that we do get uh, during when we do live uh, presentations like this is uh, about the safe rooms. And uh, again, it is basically a safe room is a reinforced room in the house. Uh, it may be steel plating, it may be uh, rebar reinforced concrete, uh, extra sheets of plywood. But basically, it's a it's a hardened reinforced room usually a solid door and extra bolting and extra heavy hinges on the door. So it basically becomes an above ground storm shelter. And there are a lot of companies around, not only in the mid South, but across the country, a lot of companies that manufacture and install safe rooms. It is something that is easier to do uh, in a new home when it's still under construction. But uh, again, there are some companies, there are some plans for retrofitting an existing room, uh, an interior closet, for example, retrofitting with that extra, uh, strengthening the material, that reinforcement, uh, to turn it into a safe room. And uh, the FEMA website, www.fema.gov, has some good information on safe rooms and on windproofing uh, your home or your building. Okay. Got any questions yet? I don't see any questions, so you must have did a very good job. <laughs> right. I, I was just going to add to what right. Gary said. Yes, right. come on in. And, and just adding to what Gary said about the uh, safe rooms, if you would register your safe rooms with our office, and you can do that by uh, contacting Kimberlyn Bowler uh, at the Shelby County Office of Preparedness, and her email address is K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-N dot 
B O U L E R at Shelby County TN.gov. Now, the reason it's important to register your personal storm shelter is in case the tornado or something happens and your building is collapsed uh, and you're trapped inside, we can let the first responders know that you have a storm shelter and that you are probably inside of that room. Excellent, excellent, good, good advice. Yes, because some of the storm shelters, again, while they are above ground, there are some models of safe rooms that are actually below ground, uh, in the garage, for example. And uh, yes, so uh, making sure that the first responders know where you are and uh, that you're probably there, then they'll know where where to look for you if uh, if if the bad thing does actually happen. Yeah, I think Andy has something. Yeah, so. Uh, so some of the questions is if you do live in a mobile home park, and Gary kind of covered this a little bit earlier, um, you just want to have a friend, a neighbor, an area where you know nearby that you can go to a substantial structure. Uh, that's the most important thing. So we get a lot of phone calls when the weather does turn nasty, where people call us, ask us where to go. And those are the kinds of things we refer them to. If they live in an area that is uh, susceptible to severe weather in a house that's not you know, uh, very strong or well built, we just ask that you to contact a neighbor or find a local business or an area where you can move to when the warnings or when a watch is issued to get yourself in a position to be prepared so that you remain safe. And that's pretty much some of the stuff we get. Uh, I was thinking maybe we debunk maybe a couple myths too. Actually, yeah, we can do that. I did want to loop back on to oh, your, okay, sure. uh, yeah. uh, as far as the mobile homes go. Another question we get sometimes is the people that live in apartments, multi-story apartment buildings you know, maybe a two or three story apartment building and they're up on the third floor. Um, I don't want to sound a trite or trivial here, but get to know your ground floor neighbor very well. In that case, you definitely do not want to be in the upper floors of a multi-story apartment building. So again, find some place down uh, at the ground level that you can get to quickly if a tornado does threaten. And know where the exits are. Don't use the elevators. Make sure you use the stairs and that's the best place to get down and out of uh, an elevated structure. So we're going to look at a couple more questions here um, and we're going to try to answer as many as we can. Just tweet them to us using uh, hashtag preparathon16 and we'll be on here just a couple more minutes uh, answering questions. So as far as the myths, Andy, what myths, yeah. what myths should we uh, should we address? So especially in Shelby County, we hear all the time, the bluffs will protect me from tornadoes. They'll keep me safe because I live downtown. I got buildings, large structures. Is that true, Gary? It is not, uh, Andy. Uh, you know, a lot of people used to think not only the bluffs, but uh, in some locations in Indian burial grounds. The, the fact of the matter is uh, it's a lot easier for a tornado to not hit where you are than for it to hit where you are. So it's really more uh, just the, the probabilities of things, uh, uh, why perhaps downtown Memphis hasn't been hit. There was a myth uh, for a number of years that downtown areas uh, could not be hit by a tornado. But in the late 90s to early 2000s, uh, we saw downtown Salt Lake City, downtown Nashville, downtown Miami, downtown Fort Worth all hit by tornadoes. So. Uh, again, a downtown, while the buildings might cause some very minor disruption to a small, weak tornado, they're not going to prevent a tornado from coming through. Sounds good. All right, anything there, Jeff? Do you have anything? Uh, do you have anything? Well, I have one thing I would okay. like to add. Okay. If, if I may, Gary, um, one thing I would like to uh, recommend to folks is to take the community emergency response team training and that way you can tie all of the things that Gary talked about today into getting yourself prepared for regardless of what the uh, hazard is um, you, you we teach you in 16 hours over a course of two Saturdays on the things that you need to do and what you should do to develop your kit we teach you things like turning off the, the water, um, the um, gas, and uh, letting you know uh, that once you turn that gas off, you're not supposed to turn it back on. You need to contact Memphis Light Gas and Water to come back in and turn it on. So if you would like to sign up for the training, you can email Eugene 
E-U-G-E-N-E dot Jones at Shelby County TN dot gov. And when will that, uh, the CERT training, when, when is that scheduled to take place? If you go to our website, staysafeshelby.us, we have them listed on, on the website, the different dates that it's, it's being, it's available. Excellent. So multiple, multiple classes. That yes. Excellent. 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 What was that email address one more time? I'll tweet it out. Stay safe, the the oh, Eugene.jones at, at Shelby County TN. weather expected right. this week now so uh yes the this actually is turning out to be a uh, a pretty appropriate uh, time to be having this having this uh, program and this effort because we will it looks like have some some weather to deal with over the uh, over the next week or so of course tomorrow looks like potentially a significant tornado event in the uh, the great plains uh, oklahoma up into kansas and southern nebraska then as that system moves east, uh, we will probably be in the uh, severe weather threat region for Wednesday. Now, the conditions on Wednesday don't, like they're, don't look like they're going to be as volatile as what we'll see in the plains on Tuesday, but we will have the potential for thunderstorms and uh, potentially some producing large hail and damaging winds as the primary threats as we go through the day on Wednesday. Uh, then after a, a quiet day or maybe two uh, after this system moves through. It looks like um, as we get towards the weekend, uh, the uh, thunderstorm chances will pick back up again and we will have uh, at least sometime during the weekend, it looks like maybe a threat for more severe thunderstorms again. A little early yet to say exactly as far as the timing, especially for the, for the weekend event, but uh, it is coming into Memphis in May and unfortunately that usually brings a lot of uh, uh, potential for severe weather, it seems like, and uh, of course, uh, it's the Mid-South, it's the end of April, it's the 1st of May, it's our climatological peak of the severe weather season, so we'll need to be, be watching out for that as well. And again, really, this is the time to not, not panic, not get scared, but this is the time to go through and remind yourselves of the, uh, these uh, things that we've talked about here today. Make sure that yourself, your, your friends, your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers are as, are as ready as we can be as we come into this, uh, this peak of the severe weather season here in Shelby County in the Mid-South. And we still haven't got any okay. questions. Yeah. Well, we will, I guess, wrap it up then. Uh, again, we want to thank you all for uh, tuning in and watching either live or the recorded version. Hopefully, uh, you uh, picked up a few nuggets of information. Hopefully, you already had some severe weather plans that were in pretty good shape. But hopefully, you picked up maybe some nuggets of information that you can use uh, going forward to strengthen your plan and make us as uh, make everyone as safe as possible for the next time severe weather threatens. So with that, uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for your attention and uh, be safe this spring. Very good, sir. Thank you.